Thank you, Marion. <clears throat> My sermon today is uh, from Ephesians uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Uh, it should be printed on the back of your bulletin. If you want to read along, you can, of course, look it up in your Bible or whatever Bible app you like to use as well. This is what Paul says. He says, You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of our flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not the result of works, so that no one can boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. There is a, uh, a, a kind of famous picture that has become kind of a joke on the internet uh, of, a, of a young man who has his shirt off and he's revealing a brand new chest tattoo that he has just gotten that goes from this collarbone to this collarbone and it says, no regrets, spelled incorrectly. You can find other pictures of people who have tattoos that say no regrets. Feels like a regret, if you ask me. In fact, what's funny is that I, I found that you can, you can buy a temporary tattoo to put on your chest to just terrify your parents at Thanksgiving or Christmas. Look at my new tattoo. No regrets. Whew. There's a regret in your tattoo, artist, my friend. I love that. It's funny because we've all got regrets, right? I, I've never talked to anybody who says, no, I've really got no regrets in life. I've never talked to anybody who says, I've got none. I'm happy with every decision I've ever made in my life. Every single one of them was perfect. Maybe I just haven't talked to the right person yet. <laughs> Maybe some of us go, yeah, that guy's got no regrets, but he should. <laughs> I've got one or two on your behalf, my friend. We've all got regrets. Whether they're financial regrets, I occasionally look back at the first year of Lauren and I's marriage and go, what were we thinking? Maybe we've got regrets for... Decisions we made with regards to jobs, decisions with regards to things we did as young people that in hindsight we go, man, I'm embarrassed by that. Maybe we've all got something that we look back on and go, I wish I had done that differently. I wish that part of my life was different. I wish, I wish, I wish. What do we do with our past as Christians? What do we do with that? Right? I, I, we've been talking about how we're, we're in this, this pilgrimage to the passion. We're, we're on our way to Easter. And of course, Easter is, is this realization that we needed God's power. We needed God's salvation. We needed the love of Jesus. We needed the death of Jesus, the, the payment and, 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 and perfection of us payment of our sins and perfections of our lives. We needed Jesus. We, we recognize that it's our fault Jesus died. Is the correct response to that to just beat ourselves up? Is that the answer? To go through life going, man, I got so many regrets. I'm sorry, Jesus. Regretfully. I don't know. I mean, let's make no mistake about it. Paul comes out here in chapter 2 pretty hot, doesn't he? <laughs> I like chapter 1. Greetings. 
Chapter 2, you were dead. Wow. Good to see you too, Paul. Good to see you too. Thanks, Paul. You were dead. You were so dead, in fact, right? Verse 2. You were following the ruler of the power of air, the spirit that is at work among those who are disobedient. Man, you were you dead, Paul says. He says, look, you've got regrets. I get it. I know there are things you wish you were doing differently. I know there are things that you wish you had been differently, done differently. I know there are things about you which you do not like. And by the way, if, if you don't think there are things that you need to be regretful about, let's remind you that you were dead. Paul kind of, uh, you know, we, we've read this. One of my favorite passages in the whole Bible is that Numbers 21 passage. It's just wild, right? What's really fun about that is that the, the, the word there that we translate poisonous is actually the Hebrew word for fiery. They're fiery serpents. Well, if you're bit by poison, I guess it stings and burns. But I like to imagine the snakes are on fire because that makes a cooler story. But the point is that what Moses is told to do is he says, hey, make the thing that they are afflicted by and make these almost dead people Look at their, um, at their very bane. Make them look at it. Make them recognize that they're almost dead. Make them look their death in the eyes, and they can be healed. And so Paul, in Ephesians chapter 2, makes us look our death in the eyes. You were dead, he says. You misstepped, you sinned, you were dead and almost buried. But Paul's a good rhetorician. Because in verse 3, he quickly takes the pressure off the people. He says, all of us were. All of us were. But you're not in this alone, he says. I, I was here too. All of us were dead in our passions. Everybody you know, every single person, we were all dead. But God... But God did not leave us dead. He says, God who is rich in mercy, out of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our missteps, he made us alive together with Christ. I need you to hear something today. Too often, because of how much we are aware of our sin, too often, because we are aware of these things which we regret that we did, too often we think that God begrudgingly loves us. You will hear it, you will feel it. God loves you only because Jesus died. As if there's like God only loves us because we've got this thing against him. That's not, that's not God's love. God does not love you because Jesus died for you. Jesus died for you because God loves you. And that is a very subtle difference, but it is important for you to understand that God loved you while you were dead. God loved me while I was trespassing. God loved us, and so he made us right. In chapter 1, in chapter 1, we, we, we find that he destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will. You see, I, I want you to hear me say that God saves you. God raised you out of your deadness. God lifted you up. God gave you a stick of a snake to look at because he loves you. He does not love you because you looked at the snake. He loved you while you were dead. And it's because of that love that he has raised you up. He's given us a way out of our deadness. He's given us a way out of our regretful behavior. He's given us a way out of the things which hold us back. Because he loves us. We're told by Paul that it is immeasurable. Like, whoa. God is rich in mercy. 
rich in mercy. It is by grace you have been saved and raised up with him. And you, we, have been seated with him in the heavenly places through Jesus the Christ. God wants to show you his grace. I love that Paul says as much grace as we've experienced right now, there's more of it that God wants to show us. There's more of it that God can't wait for us to see. There's more of it coming. There's more of it. God's grace is super abundant. It does not run out. You cannot out sin God's grace. Now, that doesn't mean try. <laughs> Seems to be that in Romans chapter 5 and 6. Paul says, you know, we can't out sin God. <laughs> But don't try, he says. It seems that there were some people in the Roman community who thought, hey, if we sin and God shows us grace and grace makes God look good, the more we sin, the better God looks. And Paul says, that is not the logic that we're going to (laughs) use. He says, we've been raised with Christ, set free from sin, set free from our trespasses, set free from the thing which kills us. We have been raised to life with God. And so I love this because Paul ends this, this brief section in chapter 2 by saying, We are what he made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life, to be the way we live. That God has created us for good works, right? Again, we can't out sin God, but don't try because you've been created for good works, not dead works. You've been created for the best thing. You've been created to live. You've been created to walk in newness of life. God has made you. Now, we have to be careful with this, okay? We live in a culture that likes to say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and make yourself something great. And Scripture's pretty clear that none of us make ourselves. God makes us. The idea that we make ourselves is American exceptionalism writ large in the culture and psyche of our world. You are not who you made you. You are who he made you. Whoever you are, God has made you. Wow. You you have been raised up from your dead self and made into something new, which God has made you. You did not make yourself You did not do it yourself. You did not help. (laughs) He did it. So be careful when we start thinking, I can do this myself. You can do nothing apart from me, God says. Period, end of story. You are who he made you. And that is good news. That is good news news. If you are insecure about who you are, I want you to take heart because you are who he made you. Now, let's make it clear. Some of us are still in process, right? I mean, I'm done, but some of you are still works in progress. (laughs) I'm just hoping God makes me into somebody with ears that don't get infections all the time. But whoever you are, God made you that way. So take heart in whoever you feel like, man, I don't know. I'm not like that person. I wish I was that person. I wish I was more like that. I wish I was more like this. Why? That's who I want to be. God has made you, Paul says. We are who he made us. You know, in in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, Paul will say, I have become all things to all people that I might save some. And as I think about us being who God made us to be, I can't help but wonder, wouldn't it be awesome if you didn't have to be all things to all people because we were a church of people that were all different and maybe as the church we would represent all kinds of people so that you could say, hey, I'm not that kind of person, but I know somebody who is. All right, let me me get you in contact with so-and-so because they can help you with this. One of the reasons that as a pastor I try to network myself with all sorts of people is because I just know my limits. 
You want to have a nerdy conversation about Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, or Harry Potter, I'm your man. Let's go. I can help with your math homework up to a certain point, but eventually I'm calling Todd. I don't know how to wire a house. I don't know how to, I don't know how to work construction. There are certain things I just don't know how to help with. But I try to find people who can because I can say, hey, God made somebody else for this who's really good at it. Let me, con- let, me, let me connect you with them. And so I want you to hear me say that God needs you in this, or we need you in this community because God has made you who you are. What if the church was full of all sorts of people so that everybody found somebody like them here? That by all means we might save some through the relationship they have with you. What if you were so confident in who God made you to be that you knew God could use that? Introverts, ambiverts, extroverts. Understanding that you don't have to get all your energy by being around people to be used by God. There are other people like you. Married people and single people, academics, athletes, and addicts, those who are still struggling, those who are in recovery, and those who are sober, nerds and fashionistas, fantasy book readers and fantasy football commissioners, young and old. You are who God made you. I like to say that the average age, uh, the average lifespan is 79 years. So if you're older than 79, you are playing with house money. Just imagine what God can do still. One of the most constant questions that I get asked as a pastor is, what is God doing with me in this season of my life? And I love helping people answer that question. I love helping people understand that no matter who you are, no matter how you are unique, God can do something with you and through you for you and for the community. I love that I get to lead a church of people who are absolutely diverse. Because we as a church are representative that God has made you who you are and created you for good works, for the glory of his name. I need you to understand that whether God has made you only five years old, I guess there's nobody in here that young. They're downstairs, but whether you were born five years, 10 years, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years ago, you are who God made you. If you're still alive, God has kept you alive. (laughs) God has made you what you are. And I hope you take heart in that. As we get near to Easter, I want you to know that, yes, it is our sin that nailed Jesus to that cross. But God can take our story full of its warts and ugliness and say, I will do something through you to help other people. You are who he has made you. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Created by God. Thank you, God, for making us. Thank you, God, for helping us grow. God, many of us look back at our pasts and we get frustrated and we get, we get too beat up on who we used to be. God, I pray that you'd help us focus on who we are, who you are making us to be, God, may we find the good works that you've created us to do. May we find the way that you have called us into new life. Thank you, Lord, for Jesus who creates us new. Thank you, God, for Jesus who was raised from the dead that we might walk in newness of life. Thank you, God, that you loved us while we still were sinning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.